Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fiba, and on behalf of Fiba, I'd like to welcome you to today's Fiba webinar, Trends in the Mutual Fund Industry. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on our latest webinars and all Fiba activity. Be sure to also follow Fiba on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Fiba underscore thank you. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentations, and we will collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We'd also like to invite you to our upcoming wealth courses. On October 25th to 26th, we have the Certified Wealth Management Associate. And in January of next year, we will have Understanding Investment Security. The instructor is actually today's moderator, Isabel Wheeler. Isabel Wheeler is CFA, founder of Wheeler Consulting LLC, and has been a leader in international private banking for more than 30 years. During that time, she was involved in every aspect of wealth management at some of the most well-known financial institutions, including Citibank, Chase Manhattan Bank, Banco Santander, and BNP Paribas. Isabel, the audience is yours. Thank you, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Um, so everyone should just, you know, grab themselves a glass of wine and listen in here because this was intended originally to be partly in person and partly online. So uh, we're just going to have some nice conversation here with our good friends. I'm very happy to welcome here with us three uh, well-known uh, people in the financial, in the uh, mutual fund industry. Most of you know um, the first two for sure, and, and many of you may know the third person. So I'll just start with introducing them. First of all, we have Darren Luxfield, who's the director of the NRC division in Alliance Bernstein. Um, Darren is uh, located in Miami and manages all of the non-resident client business in the U.S. and Canada. In addition, he is responsible for clients in the South Florida and Panama markets. Before joining the firm, he was a partner at Atlantic Financial Partners and also worked at Lord Abbott and Company. Mr. Luckfield previously worked for 17 years in various capacities at Merrill Lynch. So welcome, Darren. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Our second panelist is Paul Brito, SEMA uh, CFS Director at MFS International Limited. Um, Paul covers the southeastern United States, Central America, and the Caribbean. He joined MFS in 2006 and previously served as an associate director and senior international sales representative. His prior experience also includes registered marketing associate at Citigroup Global Markets and regional sales specialist at Pioneer Investments. He began his career in the financial services industry in 2005. He earned a bachelor's degree from Stonehill College and has also earned the CFS designation from the Institute of Business and Finance and the SEMA designation from the Institute from the Investment Management Consultants Association. He holds the Series 7 and 63 licenses from FINRA. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Isabel. And our, fin uh, our final participant is Frank Talbot, Head of Investment Research at CityWire. As Head of Investment Research, Frank is involved in investment analysis and screening of over 15,000 managers tracked globally by CityWire. His investment commentary regular features regularly features in CityWire's media, along with national press in the U.S., U.K., and throughout Europe. Having joined CityWire shortly after completing his MSc in economics, finance, and management, he has 10 years' experience in fund and manager analysis. Welcome, Frank. Thanks very much. All right, so before we get started, I wanted to, just so we know who's in our audience, I wanted just to poll you all. If you're on GoToMeeting, you can respond to this poll. And here's the question. Uh, for the audience, what percentage of your business comes from offshore clients versus onshore clients? And your responses will be A, all or mostly offshore, B, sort of half and half offshore and onshore, and C, all or mostly onshore. So we'll give you all a minute to, uh, to answer those questions if you can on your, on your um, screens there. See if we're getting some responses coming in. And we're going to close the poll in about uh, five more seconds so we can uh, just get an idea of who's in the audience. And we'll have a couple of other polling questions as we go through the, the, the discussion today. So, yeah, we're going to close the poll now and uh, take a look at the results. And, okay, well, it looks like most of you are all offshore. Are they going to be able to see them? Yeah, yeah they're they looking do. at them also. Okay, so most of you are offshore with a little bit of, of onshore. Um, so the, I would say probably two-thirds are, are dealing with offshore, so that helps the discussion here along. 
So um, we're going to start out just t taking a look at some of the issues that are facing the mutual fund industry today and start out with kind of the boring but essential question of um, the regulatory environment. So I'm going to toss this out first to Darren and then ask, uh, ask Paul uh, to join in with some comments. So the question here is, how is the regulatory environment changing for offshore mutual funds? And are you seeing any impacts from FATCA and CRS? Uh, is the fiduciary rule affecting your industry? And if you're seeing anything in the fee transparency? So Darren, why don't you get started on that question? Okay, thanks, Isabel. Appreciate that. Um, since this is sort of a legal question, I'll start out with the disclaimer that I am not a lawyer. I don't play one on television. And uh, as a salesperson and a manager of a sales division, I can tell you the effects on my business, but I can't tell you the underlying reasons for it. But uh, I will say that um, in general, the direct impact on mutual fund sales is not that significant. It's not changed a lot over the last couple of years. Obviously, it's had a tremendous impact on our clients, the dealers, the distributors, which is, I'll use the word, a distraction, and it has slowed the business down quite a bit as a result. But we in the mutual fund business, of course, rely on our dealers and our distributors to properly enforce uh, the FATCA CRS requirements, <clears throat> the KYC, suspicious activity reports, and those types of things, which would take the daily activity out of our hands. Um, so the contracts themselves that we have with the big wirehouses and the banks put that onus on them, and therefore we don't have to necessarily be involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis. That said, I know in the case when we have a level three account, for example, and we get full transparency on the name of the underlying client, we do OFAC checking of the names, and we do look for suspicious uh, activities from that regard. And so from time to time, we will get a name that will pop up on our screen. We'll have to go to the dealer, ask for information about that client. Um, sometimes it gets a little testy because, of course, these are sensitive names that, that don't necessarily want to be shared uh, readily, but uh, obviously need to be checked on both sides. It is our responsibility ultimately as well. So we do have that pop up from time to time. But again, more than ever, it's just very important for us to know the dealer, know the entity that we're working with. Um, this actually translates into another topic, which will, I'm sure, come up as we talk about changes in the industry, and that is the growth in the independent channel. And with the independents popping up, and in particular with the registered investment advisors, the RIAs, um, some of them easily fall underneath U.S. broker dealer registration requirements and therefore are covered from a legal perspective. The RIAs, however, are not. And we've been finding issues with that as people are looking at the RIA channel, they should be aware. Um, independents in that structure need to set up actual deal agreements with the fund families direct. It's a little different than if you go to work for a broker dealer, even as an independent. So the RIA channel is a little more challenging, and ultimately that falls back on us again to look at the RIA and ensure that since they're not governed by FATCA and CRS and FINRA, that in fact the RA is following the policies and procedures required by us in Luxembourg or Dublin or where have you. So that channel is a little more complicated. I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to shake out. We're now dealing with one of our first here uh, in Miami, and I think that some fund families may in fact have troubles with that. Some independents may not have policies and procedures, for example. Um, we will do the actual checking of the policy and procedures, compare it to the Luxembourg laws, compare it to the Wolfsburg questionnaire and then decide whether or not, in fact, they are compliant. So those are some of the issues that I find popping up here in, in our market. I thought I'd make one other comment, which is in the non-compliant, non-GAFI jurisdictions, not obviously pertinent to necessarily Florida, but in Panama, let's say, or Uruguay, um, we do have more issues because they're not automatically compliant with the Luxembourg laws and they haven't signed off on, on FAPCA. So as a result, we again have to go in and look at the dealer. We have to know the dealer. We have to know their policies and procedures. Again, we'll typically match them up against the Wolfberg questionnaire, make sure that what they say they have a certain policy on the questionnaire, that it actually appears in the policy and procedures. Um, that can get a bit onerous, you know, a lot, a lot of back and forth. But again, if you know your dealers in those jurisdictions, you can do business. Now, again, some fund families will say simply, I don't want to do business in those jurisdictions. That's something to know. From our, from our Florida uh, clients here that 
And in fact, some mutual funds are not sold in those jurisdictions through, through local dealers. Some will do what we do, which is that compliance check and the policy and procedure check, and some will probably just sign them up, just based on their name and reputation, I suspect. But just a, a side note on, on the non-Florida business out there. So ultimately, from our perspective, we know our dealers. If we get coupled with their policy and procedures, we have a, a very easy life when it comes to the regulatory changes that everybody's been suffering with the last couple of years. Very interesting. Um, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add to that in terms of what you're seeing at MFS? Sure. No, thank you, sir. And I think uh, Darren did a great job in kind of providing a synopsis. I think that when you get to the, the wholesale or asset manager level, uh, what we're really focusing on is understanding our dealers, uh, their checks and balances, and, and kind of how they're running their business. Uh, that being said, when you're in front of a private bank or a financial advisor, uh, a professional buyer, there is that overarching theme where people are talking about CRS, FATCA, how it impacts their business today, uh, where it could be going tomorrow, uh, and how they should be planning their business accordingly. So I would say overall we're, we're one step removed, but however, we are hand in hand uh, in, the, uh, in the battle with uh, financial advisors and, and private bankers alike to understand uh, how it's going to impact the business overall. But uh, Darren did a great job in kind of summarizing the environment. Well, I wanted to add another level to that, and it's not so much the regulatory uh, environment as much as where that's taking in terms of transparency. Um, first, Paul, and then maybe Darren can also address it. Are you seeing pressure to change the way mutual funds structure their fees? And obviously that can have a direct impact on the financial advisors who offer those, those mutual funds. Sure. Uh, I can start off. Yeah, I think two things. Number one is, we have seen, uh, you know, a bifurcation in um, the selection of share classes. So some people are still uh, focusing on uh, load share classes where they're charging uh, fees either upfront or, you know, trailers and commissions are built into them. But we are seeing more and more people going to wrap or um, advisory share classes because of the environment we're in. In addition to that, I would say that the DOL, the Department of Labor ruling, and at least for the business it's within the United States with U.S. broker-dealers, that looks like it's going to be putting an additional pressure on um, not only the broker-dealers and what kind of share classes they're uh, dealing with, but also, again, hand-in-hand -hand with the asset managers to understand how the share classes are priced, the TR, what the breakdown is, what is the management fee, what is the 12B1 fee, what is comprised of the other expenses, is there a cap, is it an actual fee. So absolutely, we're looking into uh, those share classes. And again, uh, I think DOL provides an extra layer of, um, of uh, uncertainty in terms of where the share class um, direction will go going forward. What about you, Darren? Did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I have to. I have to laugh or smile because uh, I go back to my Merrill Lynch days in the early 2000s when uh, I was actually responsible for the separately managed account business, which of course is built on the whole idea of transparency. And at that time, we were trying to encourage the business, I'll say, by educating folks about expenses and fees and, and explaining how eventually the business would get to the point where clients are going to know the expenses and fees and we need to be ahead of the curve. Well. Here we are 15 years later, and it's happening, I would say, for, the, for, for various and sundry reasons. I would agree with Paul's observation about DOL as being perhaps an impetus for some of our clients here based in the U.S., but generally, I think the whole discussion about, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to where I think the business is, is perhaps going, but the discussion about ETFs. Um, is also driving this. Clients are asking the questions now. What are the TERs? What are the expense ratios? What are you charging me? And as a result, I would say I'm seeing an increasing number of FAs in my region and, 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 uh, and, and throughout the, the, the territory uh, voluntarily going towards transparent structures. Um, the, the unified management account, whatever you want to call it, the various firms. Actually, we, we tried to launch that in Maryland 15 years ago, and it didn't go anywhere. So again, to show you that the length of time it takes to get this sort of uh, uh, institutional mindset turned around, but now it is really taking off. And I think step one, as Paul mentioned, is to go from the, the upfront commission share class structure, and then of course the deferred commission share structure, 
Now it's getting into the institutional share structure with a wrap fee. So we're getting to the point of transparency, explaining to clients what the fees are, and they're going to actually see them, you know, on a quarterly basis. And uh, uh, once that takes place, then the question is going to be, well, what about a cheaper structure? Step one might be, for example, a separately managed account where the fees might be less than an institutional share, and then ultimately an ETF where that might make sense in some of the more efficient sectors. So, yeah, the business is evolving. It's taken a long time to get there, but I think it's moving exponentially in that direction in terms of transparency right now. Right. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Well, I think before we move to the next one, I just wanted to add a, a, ask a poll question here of the audience related to the issues of regulatory. So if you all uh, can answer the question of how many in the audience have lost clients due to regulatory issues. Um, we'll let that poll stay open for uh, 15 or 20 seconds while you all have a chance to answer that. Um, so if uh, everyone can just start putting in those answers. We're getting some responses here. Okay. Yeah, we'll leave it for another another. Um, 10, 15 seconds here. So don't like to have dead air, but I think it's interesting to have this information because it lets you all see what's happening to other people in the industry as well. Um, and yeah, the, the issue of fee transparency, I think, is, is really interesting to financial advisors who've been relying for so many years on the, uh, you know, either the, the nice end shares where you have a, a big retrocession coming in and clients get this idea that they're, quote, not paying anything to be in mutual funds. So uh, that's going to definitely change the industry. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and, and look at the, so it looks like pretty much even. Some of you don't think it's applicable and then uh, sort of half and half with the rest in terms of, of losing clients for um, to, to regulatory issues. So, yeah, I think that's going to continue to, to push, the, push the industry. Well, let's get off of sort of that boring regulatory stuff and talk, <laughs> talk more about, you know, the, the interesting stuff. And so um, let, I'm going to start this question off with, uh, with Paul. Uh, Paul, where are the fund flows coming from and going to in mutual funds? Are there any particular countries that stand out or any client segments that seem to be either increasing or decreasing their, their activity in mutual funds? Sure. Thanks, Isabel. Yeah, and it um, seems like a simple question, and I'll try to kind of break it down into three parts. The first is I kind of looked at global trends, so not only cross-border uh, fund sales, but also 40 Act uh, funds for, for U.S. clients. And then second, just drill down more into our market, which is the America's cross-border sales in terms of gross sales. And then finally, net sales, just year over year looking at where net assets have really stuck and, and what that means to our market. So when you look at global trends, what you've seen is, is kind of three things. The first thing is that you know, mutual fund assets and growth outside of the U.S. are growing faster than the U.S. mutual fund space. And that's really a post-08 phenomena. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, the sharp change in trajectory is actually from since 2011, but even since 2008, you've seen a lot more growth ex-U.S. in terms of cross-border funds versus U.S. So that's the first thing that, that strikes you when you look at the data. The second thing is total assets in mutual fund have slightly dipped over the past uh, over the past year as well. So uh, to Darren's point, I think that uh, not only the volatility, and we can talk about the different factors that are out there on the macro uh, level, but also ETFs have made just global mutual fund assets dip, still a very strong base, but uh, nonetheless dip year over year uh, in terms of total assets. And then finally, one thing that's really astonishing, and we'll drill down into that a little bit with the cross-border space, is that we've really seen a sharp increase in global uh, fixed income mutual fund sales for the cross-border space. So despite the fact that <clears throat> interest rates are historically low, despite the fact that most professional investors think that interest rates are going to rise, year over year, and we'll get into it in a second, we've seen a large increase in mutual fund flows into fixed income. So uh, a pretty interesting dynamic that I think if, if we looked at it uh, 12 to 24 months back, we would probably not have predicted that, but that's really what's unfolded. Second, when you look at kind of sales, gross sales, you know, data year over year, uh, and this is through uh, the end of August, the most recent data, what you'll see is a few trends. The first is 
uh, as I mentioned, you know, bonds or the, what they call the, the bonds global currencies category, which is uh, a huge bucket, continues to be uh, number one. And if you look across the pond and you look at, um, you know, Asia and equity, uh, you, uh, Asia, excuse me, in Europe, you'll see the exact same thing. The second thing is, if you look at the top five um, gross sales buckets, there's only one asset class that's actually equity. So four of them are, uh, are fixed income. Uh, that one is uh, not a surprise. It's North American equities, which is number two, which garnered about $3.5 billion of assets. But uh, overall, you're getting about $13 billion into fixed income versus um, about $3.5 billion into equities if you look at the top five. And then if you look at the overall kind of top 14, the biggest constituents, you'll see that there's really, there's four equity and 10 fixed income. The four equity are North American equities, uh, Pacific ex Japan equities, Japan equities, and global equities. So again, a very strong uh, shift in weighting towards fixed income, which again, in this interest rate environment, you'd think you'd see the shift, uh, but it hasn't been that. And then finally, the, the last two things, and, and I'll stop for questions just on the on the growth side. On the growth side is, you know, um, when you look at the Americas, and we'll talk about the net sales. In terms of gross sales, we have not seen a lot of flows into asset allocation vehicles, uh, money uh, market vehicles, or mixed assets. Uh, and that's similar in Asia and Europe. Now that doesn't look the same on a net sales basis, but you do see it in growth. So um, it's been a, a pretty interesting dynamic there. And then uh, lastly, you know, when you look at net sales and you compare it, you'll see that you know emerging market debt was definitely a, a big winner in relative terms. So there was about a billion dollars in net new assets going into the EMD bond space. And then that's more of a strategic play within the Americas, but there was really three tactical flow winners, if you will. The first, which was very surprising when I looked at the data, was German equities was actually the second highest net sales uh, bucket that was a receiver of assets, which raised about $600 million in new assets. Uh, bonds in Euro investment grade and European equities in the small mid cap space, which typically historically in the Americas uh, cross-border space have not been uh, kind of a core asset class, but they were uh, the tactical uh, winners. And then lastly, you know, mixed assets, despite not having a good gross number, as I mentioned, did very, very well. So uh, three of the top 14 categories in terms of net sales uh, were mixed assets. So whether they were labeled in the bucket of asset allocation, asset allocation alternatives, mixed asset dynamics or others really, really did uh, extremely well into the, uh, the asset allocation uh, category. So overall, in summary, you know, mutual fund assets have dipped uh, on a global level. Uh, in the cross-border space, you've seen a lot of preference for fixed income or continued preference towards fixed income and multi-asset vehicles uh, doing very well overall. People looking for yield, uh, nimbleness, tactical uh, abilities to, to uh, maneuver within these markets. Darren, did you want to add anything to that? Um, based on your comments, Paul, the numbers you gave and the sectors you raised as being top sellers, it sounds like you're quoting cross-border globally. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so the, the database yeah. I used was Lipper FMI Sales Watch. So yep. it's just the one that, that I see that looks the most consistent uh, over, uh, yep. over time periods. That makes sense. Okay, well, I, I have another report which breaks it down into Latin America um, cross-border assets. The trends are generally the same as what you uh, you highlighted there. And I, I take this data with a grain of salt. This is all self-reported data by the dealers. Um, some dealers don't participate. Some fund families over. So it's it's directional. It's not not you know that detailed in it, or it's not that accurate in my opinion, but directionally the, the general flow is what you mentioned. What I'm seeing in Latin America though, in terms of flows year to date, if I annualize them also through August, generally they're down about 20 to 25 percent from last year. So the money in motion has definitely slowed down and I and no speaking other wholesalers, we've all felt that, that, that that's pretty pretty much the case across the board. Breaking that down into the two major categories, um, the equity fund flows are actually down north of 30%, so a lot less money flowing into equities from our 
Latin America region, and fixed income is only down about 5%. So again, directionally the same thing as what Paul was saying, and perhaps again surprising given everyone's forecast for the year, but then again, who would, who would have expected the fixed income returns that we have here to date and how tremendously strong they've been? So uh, there's always that element of chasing returns. Um, we've seen similar uh, flow directions within our own firm, just to, to say broadly. Um, I would say this is simply a reflection of money in motion, however, and not, not a reflection of outflows per se. Our assets under management in Latin America are actually flat from the beginning of the year, so uh, with a little bit of gain, probably due to price appreciation. So what I'm, what I'm seeing in the field and then what I see in the data is there's a lot of, of uh, you know, lack of wanting to move, there's a lot of lack of conviction. The ideas that are out there are strong. I know we're going to talk about asset class performance in a minute. Uh, the ideas are strong. The performance is actually quite good, but I think most people are willing to sit with where they are today or where they were at the beginning of the year and kind of wait it all out. And, and that's what we're seeing in these numbers. Um, Frank, let me pull you into the conversation now. Thank you for patiently waiting through the, the regulatory part of it. But Frank, what are, what are you seeing from, from your perspective at CityWire? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spend a lot of time following the money, just like uh, it sounds like Paul and Darren do. And uh, on the active side, looking at global net flows, since the sort of beginning of 2015, and I, I trust this data, it's saying that we're looking at a contraction of something like $74 billion, which isn't that big a number when you consider the news about the death of active. It's only really a half a percent contraction in totally invested assets in mutual funds on the active side. But when you do compare it next to the near trillion dollars that's gone into the passive industry since the beginning of 2015, it, it starts to look like there is definitely a sea change afoot, and, and both Paul and Darren highlighted that. And that's why you've got asset managers buying up ETF providers um, in order to cope with this, this change in this changing environment. Um, and, and, and on the sort of asset class level, totally back up what Paul said, mixed assets on a net basis, that's been a, a strong seller. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, you've got equity mutual funds which are down something like a quarter of a trillion dollars since the beginning of 2015 in terms of net outflows during that time. So there is a massive change. But just like Paul said, there is a big difference between what's going on in 40 Act mutual funds and what's going on in the USIT space in the rest of the world. In USIT, they are more positive and they're still buying these funds. And, and if we look at what's going on in, in the passive side, all of that money is going into these developed equity portfolios where investors have lost some faith in, in the ability of the active management industry to, to deliver positive outperformance. And, and you can't really blame them when you see some of the numbers around sort of 20% of mutual fund managers in uh, North American equities outperforming, similar story long term in global equities. Um, but I think, again, that sort of hides some of the truth. Specialization. Is, is a genuinely good strategy in active management. And I think I had a question on this for the audience. Yeah, we, yeah, we have another polling question that we'll put up for you right now. Uh, and the question is, um, in what percentage of sectors do you think fund managers have outperformed on average over the past five years? So for the audience, what percentage of managers do you think by sector have been able to outperform in the, in the past five years? We'll give them a second to answer this question. In other, so it's really trying to measure your sense of whether there's much value to, to active management. You didn't put 100% on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry about that. There was no 100% column. <laughs> I, think, I, think you, I think you might know something we don't know, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, what do we... What, what, about, what about Darren and Paul? What do you think it is? Over the last five years, um, it's been a beta trade, right? I mean, very little dispersion and very difficult markets, so I would guess it's in the 30 to 40 percent range. Okay, we're going right. to close the board right. now. 20 to 30 on my side. Price is right, 20 to 30. Yeah. Well, let's see. The audience thinks that 30 to, you know, is that 30 to 40 percent? 
50 percent of the audience, 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent have outperformed. Okay, so uh, according to our proprietary data, none of the audience were right, and it's actually 40 to 50 percent. It's actually, in fact, 49 percent. So that's on average our fund managers outperforming in all sectors over the past five years. We're tracking 240 odd sectors, 120 of them. Uh, on average, the fund manager is outperforming in 49% of cases. And I think I was pretty astonished when I saw this and I triple checked the numbers. But if you believe the news, you'd think that somehow active managers aren't really adding value. And I'm coming at this from a purely independent standpoint. I mean, if, if the numbers tell me something, I'll interpret it in a certain way. And, and just like Darren said, or was it Paul, that it has been a beta trade, and, and that has made it quite tough for fund managers to keep pace with that. But there are, there are loads of examples I could reel off about. The more specialized the investment, the more likely it is to outperform. One area where fund managers have really been delivering is actually in uh, North America. So in every single US dollar denominated debt sector over the past five years, fund managers have on average outperformed, except US dollar high yield. And even then, it's only a marginal underperformance. And I would be feel much, much safer if I was in an active product in US dollar high yield than a passive one, particularly as defaults start to spike. And with the way the index is constructed, with everything, regardless of quality, being included, then you're going to get dragged under with that. But I think that, I mean, that's, municipals have outperformed pretty handsomely, U.S. dollars, treasury, you name it, the, the, the work. And I think that is um, something that many investors probably wouldn't have expected. And it's consistent across lots of the debt sectors. On the corporate space, the, the global sector actually underperforms, and, and that's a general theme, actually. The more global your strategy, the harder it is to outperform. I'm not saying fund managers don't outperform. I'm just saying the percentages certainly drop. In the corporate space, if you were to focus on just the dollar market or just the euro market, you'd have a much higher likelihood of picking an outperforming fund manager. Very interesting. Um, any Frank, can we get you to do a roadshow with us? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to chat with my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, let's, start, let's move then to the third question that we are, the third topic we're looking at here, which is, New trends in, uh, in the offshore space. Um, so, Frank, let me toss this one out to you to start with, and then we'll bring uh, Paul and Darren in. It. What new trends are you seeing in the offshore space? So, yeah, looking at the, the whole offshore space, um, I mean, I think you've, you've got to address, as I did, the sort of the growth in passives, and nothing's been flavor of the month more than these minimum volatility strategies, which, which have done really well. And, and they've done really well because you've had these defensive stocks performing really well. But the, the phrase defensive expensive has been going around for quite some time. And you've got to start believing it when the yield on those equities isn't as attractive as it once was. And only recently have we started to see the more cyclical sectors in the past few months really recover as the risk on appetite has increased and people have started going to the more uh, so growth oriented equities. Um, Another side's been the sort of active ETFs. I'll move off passive in a second. I, active ETFs, they really haven't taken off. I mean, they're, 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 they're a spec on the inflows into to passive portfolios. But I think they would really take off if you could somehow get them to be executed in 15 minutes, like an equity or an ETF. I can trade it and I can buy that portfolio right there and then within 15 minutes. So I can exploit, potentially get there on the right day. Maybe the election goes one way and I think an infrastructure portfolio is going to do out of it. I'd like to be able to execute on that day and have that appreciation instead of having to go to the individual stocks. And I think that's when they, they probably would start to do well. Um, one area that's sort of absent on that front is, is mixed asset ETFs haven't taken off at all. Vanguard is, to my knowledge, pretty much the only player in this market. And the inflows have been negligible. And you'd think that's where an ETF would come into its own. If I'm a guy walking down the street and I think, okay, I want to put $1,000 into the market, I don't care where it is, I just want a total package, a total solution, I want to buy one ETF right there at an efficient price, that's where I see it becoming quite useful for a purely retail investor. Um, on the active side, the real growth and innovation still coming in the liquid alternative space. 
And going back to the flows briefly on that is that there's a real contrast between what's going on in 40 Act portfolios here in the States and in the USITS world. In the States, actually, they've pulled out money since the beginning of 2015. Around 70 billion has come out. But outside of the, the US, around 74 billion has come in. So you'd look at it globally and say there's been a negligible increase in interest in these liquid alternatives products. But that is missing the point quite significantly. And if I was going to guess why that might be, I think a lot of it has to do with the maturity of these products. So you've got a situation in Europe where usage powers were extended in 2003 to allow derivative usage in these portfolios. And you first started seeing products come to market in a meaningful way at the post-credit crisis period, early 2009. And from then, they built up their track records. But just like they have in the US, the bad funds closed. You, know, you had a situation of mass consolidation where you get a raft of launches from maybe long-only houses who want to get in on this action but don't have the expertise to run derivatives portfolios on the side. And equally, you get hedge fund strats coming in who can't deal with the daily liquidity. So sure enough, these funds, they close. And, and I think we've seen pretty much a similar thing going on in 40 app portfolios in the States. And it hasn't become as ingrained in people's investment process, where in Europe, you've got track records going back maybe 10 years in certain cases. People can see, okay, there's value to these portfolios. But if, if you've got a situation where you've got an equity market rally and a bull market rally, which are both going on at the moment, why would I pay for the protection and the frankly pretty lackluster returns I'm going to get in a liquid alternatives product when it's, it's not doing much for me because I can just go out there, buy the S&P 500, and I'm going to be up 10% or, or buy UK equities, and equally I'm going to have a, a great time of late. And I think it hasn't been enough to, to, to embed it in people's processes. But I do think the time when you need these kind of sophisticated products is going to come when the rate rising environment comes as well. And uh, do you think the asset management industry is prepared for rising rates? I mean, that, that's a pretty good question. Um, do I think it's prepared for it? I think we did a study recently on um, the longevity of bond fund managers. So what their life experiences are like when they were born. So your average bond fund manager globally is, I might be getting this wrong, 43 years old. So when they were nine years old, that's when rates started dropping in the early 80s, right, beginning of the 80s. So rates hit 15%. We're talking about the U.S. here, but pretty similar to the rest of the world. And then it's just, from that point onwards, it's been this inexorable downward trend. You've had, it's just, if you were long on rates, long on um, the fact that they were going to go down, you'd have made your clients money. And it was a pretty easy trade. Sure, there were little bits around the margins. There, there are periods when rates have backed up a little bit. But the overall trend has been down, down, down until where we find ourselves today at, at virtually zero. And the average bond fund manager's experience is probably more telling. So on average, a bond fund manager has about eight, eight and a half years experience. That means that they, they took their first job as a named portfolio manager in fixed income during the height of the credit crisis. These people were born in a crisis. All they've ever really known is this this sort of morphine drip of uh, quantitative easing, stimulating the debt market and, and driving investors to sort of panic and, and propping up the world and throwing tantrums whenever they, they see it backing up. But at some stage, it, it's got to turn. Now, I don't work in fund management and I couldn't tell you whether or not they're prepared for it, but you've seen so many fund managers taking out too much protection against rising rates, too, using too many derivatives, and it's hurt hurt returns. You're talking about people who've maybe got 10, 20 years experience, you're real sort of veteran bond fund managers who are most likely to be able to, to call these scenarios. But again, all they've ever known is a declining rate environment. And, and they're just as scared as everyone else for what happens next. And that's where I think these all usage products are going to come in into their own, particularly around the bond strategy side, using more sophisticated products. We've already seen uh, the use of structured products within bond portfolios going up. So they're artificially simulating the yield that they can't get from general debt, emerging market debt, local and hard currency, 
have, have taken in lots of money over the past four months, been in the top five sellers on a sectoral basis globally over that period, billion, billion and a half per month since the middle of Ju July. And, and people are sort of, they're, they're, they're running for the, what, where they think they can get more yield, but is it, is it circumspect and is it too risky? Interesting. Darren, did you uh, have anything you wanted to add in terms of the trends in the market? <clears throat> yeah, I guess uh, we covered the topic of fee-based wrap accounts, SMAs, ETFs pretty well. Um, I've been saying for some time now, and Frank, I'm going to pick up on a point you made earlier, that the mixed asset ETF has not been very effective so far. I've been saying for some time now that it's my belief that the, the active management mutual fund industry is going to gravitate towards products that are structurally better for the client as opposed to relying on trying to beat an index or beat a, beat a sector. Um, and I think multi-asset when I think of that first and foremost. You know, we've got a number of products at AB that I, I, I promote very actively right now where the history of the fund is very strong, the performance is great, but what I, I really get comfort is probably 90% of the return comes from the structure of that fund in perhaps hedging rates, for example, or trying to take credit risk and blending assets that are non-correlated to give you a better low volatility solution. Those kind of structures, I think, will be the survival of the active management business. And by so doing with these structural uh, products, you get away from the problem of the manager not having enough experience or the manager making the wrong decision or just the market's moving against us, right? Nobody predicted interest rates to fall this year. Nobody. And yet they have. So you get into a structural product. I think that's the, the, the future of our business. And ultimately then what it does, it keeps the clients bounded with less volatility, less losses, and therefore stays in the game. And, and at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right, is keeping the client invested because if they're not, they're going to miss those one, two, three, five, ten best days in the market and, and therefore will not get the, the total return. So I've gone a little off track there, but I, I see that as, as the history for us. And, and Frank, thanks for your comments. I thought those were interesting. You know, I think it's it's interesting also because being as how I'm on the north side of 43, I remember the 80s very well, and, and they were <laughs> and they were they were very they were very uh, challenging times. Paul, what about you? Is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I think uh, we covered the bulk of it, and just to piggyback off of Darren's um, comments, I think that not only does the product development and product design have to be uh, just strategically uh, structured in terms of how we're building it and how we're looking to generate alpha, but also I think that going forward when you're having the, the talk with a financial advisor uh, or a financial professional, you really have to be able to articulate and clients are want to be going to understand how they actually source that alpha. And an example would be at MFS, we have something that we call lengthening the time horizon, which is really the bedrock of how we generate alpha. Um, won't go into that in too much detail, but the point is, is you know, we're going five, six, seven, eight years out and trying to beat the market where there's a bigger arbitrage in understanding what's going to happen eight years out, whereas ETFs, you're really trying to figure out where are the flows today and how can I trade this and stay in front of this. So in addition to Darren's comments about product development and, and actually strategically building a product, I think that um, asset managers are really focusing a lot as well on their messaging and how they're generating alpha because that way professional advisors can really be able to say, okay, well, we're going active in this space because of XYZ. We're going passive in this space because of uh, DEF and, and being able to really articulate it because without that, it really becomes a little confusing both to the advisor as well as the end client. Uh, so I think the asset management firms are, are really trying to adapt to that uh, that new normal, if you will. Yeah, I think yeah, that so definitely. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Frank. Sorry, I just think I mean pragmatism is going to win the day here. I mean, if if you can see that there's a market in which active management is struggling, and you're you're going to think, okay, I think think the passive option is the right way here. But equally, if someone tells me they're going passive in emerging markets, they're not going passive. I mean, sorry, they're not investing for the long term. In my mind, if, you, if you're 
not going active in emerging markets, you are missing out on the potential to outperform. Not only that, but the costs of exposure to a broad emerging market solution are 60 to 75 basis points. When you compound that over a long time, that leads to quite large underperformance, and they still haven't become that efficient. But anyway, as I'm saying, I think um, you've got to put your portfolios together with, with pragmatism in mind. Yeah, I think just to finish up on this question, as, as someone who's been a relationship manager and dealt with clients, I, I think it really requires financial advisors to to be very uh, focused on keeping themselves up to date with what's happening in the space because the clients, that, in order to be served by all of these dynamic changes, really are going to need to have the educational component on the part of their um, so let's just move to the last question because I know it's getting close to the end of the day and if anyone took my advice and is having a glass of wine, they, they're probably ready to sign off at this point. Um, but before I ask the question, I want to do a, a, a poll, the final poll of the audience. So in the audience, what asset classes do you think are going to outperform in the next 12 months? And I'll give about uh, 10, 15 seconds for people to answer this and then we'll... Uh, We'll get the professional opinions. It's kind of going to be open to everybody. So um, I'll start with, with Darren, then go to Paul, and then to, to Frank to answer where they're seeing the, the potential outperformance. So um, we're getting our poll in progress. Um, give it another few seconds here for people to answer. Um, and... All right, I'm going to close the poll uh, in a minute. Okay, we're going to close it now. Go ahead. All right, so interestingly, almost half of you think that alternatives are going to outperform. 36% think equities, 9% fixed income, and 9% cash. So that's, uh, that's an interesting and uh, probably a predictable response. So, um, so Darren, let me start with you then on this one. Where, where do you think the asset classes are likely to outperform? Well, I'm going to get on my crystal ball here. <laughs> yeah, exactly what the markets. I'm going to give you a projection on the S&P for next year? No. Uh, me, personally, I'm cautious, uh, and, and so I generally tend towards the, uh, the statement up front, which is balance makes more sense. But if I had to pick, pick one right now, in a 12-month period, not three, 12, the next three months. is going to be a little hairy, right? But I think in 12, it's going to be equities. Okay. Yeah. Paul, what about you, your crystal ball? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think... I mean, I would agree with Darren. I think equities will outperform here. I think that the areas where there will be the most dispersion is going to be more in uh, global equities. Uh, so non-U.S. Uh, equities in particular, uh, you know, ex-U.S. developed markets would be the areas that we think will outperform. And Frank, what about you? Yeah, actually, I'm going to have to chime in and also say that I think equities will probably do pretty well. I think the environment's accommodative towards it you're going to see fresh rounds of quantitative easing going on over the next 12 months, and that's really going to support the equity markets. I also think that, um, exactly like Paul, that global XUS is probably going to be where it's at. And I say that because on a currency basis, the dollar is just so overwhelmingly strong at the moment that even if the domestic equity markets in the UK or Europe or wherever you're investing don't actually perform that well, there is going to be a, a, the dollar has to weaken at some stage. Uh, the, the pound at 1.22, 1.21 is definitely cheap. And I think that gives you some support. So, yes, yeah, select equity markets around the world, I think, would do pretty well. Well, then let me ask you a question. If, if Well, first of all, knowing clients, particularly clients from our region of the world, like Latin America, they... Um, they resist mm -hmm. equities. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say that, that this expectation of outperformance would lead people to move uh, from a debt to equity. Do you think that could potentially have an impact on what's going to happen in, in debt markets? Is, is there enough leverage in the market that you know, some movements out of, out of the sector could create some significant underperformance and significant losses? Frank? Oh, sorry, that was to me. Um, sorry. Well, if I'm going to ask all of you, but I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, a rotation uh, out of debt into equity has been, has been long foretold and hasn't really come to pass yet. I think if, if rates start to back up considerably, and I'm not just talking about one or two moves from the Fed next year, I'm talking about a succession of rises, then, yeah, I think we could see a, a real shake-up, and I think equity markets could do well in that. 
A lot of it has to do with inflation and whether we start to see that come through. And as yet, we haven't really seen the signs that inflation is coming. And that's what makes equities even more attractive in a high inflation environment. Paul, what about you? Yeah, I honestly, uh, I would I would disagree that we're eventually going to get that great rotation. And the reason is, uh, as Frank had mentioned, we've been talking for this for years. And at the end of the day, somebody has a certain risk profile. If they've been investing in fixed income for 20 years now to go to an all equity approach or a majority of their portfolio in equities, I find it hard to believe. So I think that's why when you look at the cross-border flows, not only number one, multi-asset vehicles, but Frank, Frank had mentioned two, uh, liquid alternatives, but even number three, a lot of the um, a lot of the strategies Darren had alluded to as well, just kind of more um, objective uh, goals based strategies that are either low vol or multi asset or long short, um, something that's going to mitigate the downside risk, generate income. It'll feel more like a bond, but have the upside and or income of an equity, I think that's where the money will go. Um, and that's why flows have gone in that space. But I just find it hard to believe with all the baby boomers in the world and their uh, their relevant risk profile that they'll go from fixed income and, you know, eight years into the economic expansion in the U.S. go into equities. Uh, if it does happen, I think they will have a, a very, very, a tough experience because uh, eventually a recession will happen. It's part of uh, the cycle, and it's probably sooner rather than later, at least in uh, in MFS's eyes. So um, hopefully the the multi asset kind of low vol liquid alt space is somewhere where they can um, get downside protection, get a little bit of income, and still get some capital appreciation. Darren, any uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I think it transitioned into me well. Thanks, Paul. The um the sense I get from our portfolio managers on the fixed income side is definitely one that we are in the later stages of a credit cycle here. And with that, it's time to take caution, take time to uh, not stretch for yield and, and avoid, um, I think Frank mentioned earlier, the potential for spike and default rates. So the credit side certainly is one where we are being defensive and, and reducing uh, risk. But on the other side, rates are equally of course, concerning, right? As you've said all along, you know, rates could rise, and we've been waiting that, waiting for that just about all of our business career, I think, uh, Isabel. But it's, it's, you know, maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. But on the same side, it can, it can be a surprise for a lot of investors when they, they think that something is very safe shows losses. Um, I think that the sense I get is you can still make money in fixed income, and, and ultimately we will probably be preaching this when and if there is a pullback that. You have to remember that bonds, of course, are contracts. Contracts have maturities, they have coupons, and unless they default, you're going to get your money back. So it is an area where you can still make money and, and, and be safe, and of course it is a diversifier against other risk assets that you have, but it's one where I think there is a definite sense of caution right now in our shop. Well, super. Well, we're coming to the end of our of our hour, and I um, unless any of, any of you has a last thoughts you'd like to add here, um, I just want to thank all the people for participating who were with us today. Uh, thank you to Frank Talbot from CityWire, Paul Brito from MFS, and Darren Luckfield from Alliance Bernstein. Uh, we've all known each other for a lot of years, and uh, the, the conversation will continue. Um, for those of you who joined us and who would like to share this, and I, I have to say I think it's been a really substantive conversation with a lot of topics that I think are of interest uh, to people who maybe weren't willing to sit here on a Friday afternoon. So the recording of this will be available, and uh, we'll make sure that it's on FIBA's website. If anybody's interested in, in accessing it, you can reach out to me as well, because I think this is something that's worth sharing with people later on. Um, one final thing for the people on the call, I wanted to let you know that FIBA is going to do part of its wealth management uh, event series is on Tuesday the 18th. There is going to be a discussion of Columbia's tax amnesty. Um, it is going to be in person here at FIBA's, uh, at FIBA's offices at 80 Southwest 8th Street. If you're interested in attending, please contact FIBA to register because I think that's going to be an interesting discussion. So again, thank you to all of you. Enjoy your weekend. Frank, Darren, and Paul, thank you all for being with us. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Good weekend. All right. Goodbye.